everyone, this is Arm Comedy, the satiric news show from Armenia, and we're back to keep you updated on the war. Which is now at a moment of truce, but with neighbors like Azerbaijan, you never really know. Because sometimes they announce truce while shelling Karabakh. They just call it multitasking. But let's hope this one is going to hold. Let's go. The Western media has a hard time understanding this conflict. Armenia is fighting Azerbaijan, but who the hell is Nagorno-Karabakh? Azerbaijan attacked Nagorno-Karabakh, why is Armenia involved? No panic! Sometimes when things get really serious, it takes a couple of comedians and journalist wannabes to help figure out what's going on. Let's start with Azerbaijan's historic claims for Karabakh. What do historians have to say about this? But they need to be non-partisan. Okay, sure. No Armenians. I would never do that. How about someone from the region, neither Armenian nor Azerbaijani? How about a Persian? Historically, no such entity has ever existed, and as we'll see later, it only began uh, in late May of 1918 when such an entity was created mostly in a, in a political aspect. So basically, the state of Azerbaijan is younger than this. 32 years younger than Coke. Hey, I'm 32. <laughs> Azerbaijan was created by an entire Narek lifetime later than this bottle of sugar, water, and more sugar. And in case you're wondering, how did Karabakh end up under Azerbaijani rule in the first place? Well, this guy. The next day after it was decided and stamped that Karabakh will be a part of Soviet Armenia, Joseph Stalin, or as his friends call him, Joey, had a sudden change of heart. How you doing? This is Joey. So hey, I know we decided to give Karabakh to Armenia, but on second thought, let's give it to Azerbaijan. No, no, no need to redo the paperwork. Who needs legal document? Just tell everyone Stalin said so. Their means are not gonna like that? I know. Tell them we'll make Karabakh an autonomous republic under Azerbaijan. See how that plays. So yes, Karabakh got stuck with pretty bad bosses for about 70 years. Horrible bosses when you think about it. The bosses didn't do much with Karabakh. Very little construction, very low financing, just wanted as little to do with it as possible. Why? Because the land was inhibited with Armenians. And then when the Soviet Union collapsed, every country in it, including Armenia, Ukraine, Georgia, even Kazakhstan, yes, declared independence. And here is Azerbaijan doing that. Parliament, Parliament of Azerbaijan voted for the act of independence. And here's Karabakh doing the exact same thing. 99% of referendum voters voted in favor of independence. International observers registered no violations in the electoral process. So it's okay for Azerbaijan to just declare they're independent from USSR? But it's not okay for Karabakh to declare the very same independence from Azerbaijan. Once again, these days, the blame game was on on who started the hostilities. And to help you understand who started this round of escalations, let's face one long ignored aspect. It's called logic. Armenians won the war in 1994 and currently control Karabakh. Now, why would the Armenian side be interested in provocations? Perhaps there have been signs of willingness to start a war somewhere else that the world didn't notice much. Some well-disguised signals. You've been quoted sometimes as saying that if Armenian side did not withdraw its troops from the seven occupied territories uh, from Azerbaijan and return this land, then Azerbaijan would take these provinces back through a military offensive. Do you maintain this position? This is fundamental right of Azerbaijan. We want to put an end to that by peaceful means, and we are working on that, but at the same time, our patience also has limits. Did that sound like a threat to you? How about this one? Therefore, no one can exclude any kind of scenario on the line of contact. Therefore, the sooner solution is found, is the better for everyone including Armenia. And just so nobody can say, oh, I missed the interview on TV, he actually went face to face with European Parliament to voice the threat. Check out the cute faces of European MPs when the war threat is voiced. For more than 20 years, we are committed to negotiation process, but everybody should understand, including Armenians, that this process cannot last forever. Peaceful negotiations can't go on forever. Now, just to make sure all the Europeans get it, how about a punchline? Cannot last forever. Sooner or later, something may happen. Yep, sooner or later, something did happen. And this is how Azerbaijan's foreign minister Mamed Yarov proves it wasn't them who started it. 
recent interview to CNN. Let me tell you the little bit story of it, uh, why it's happened. We was uh, with, uh, I was with my president uh, in Washington on this nuclear summit. When I get uh, at uh, April 2nd a call from uh, Foreign Minister of Russia, Sergei Lavrov, who asked me that there is uh, clashes on the line of contact and uh, it should be stopped. So basically, it was Russian foreign minister who informed them about the clashes. They had no idea. Oh my God, so what happened next? I immediately informed the president and uh, we talked to the Minister of Defense. We said just yes, uh, there is an attack and it start, starts uh, on the night when uh, Armenian armed forces start attacking civilians. So right after Lavrov called, they were like, oh my God, Minister of Defense, is that true? And the minister was like, yeah, I didn't really want to tell you, bother with the news of war. But since you know already, yeah, it's, it started. You know, Armenians just, just started to shoot for no reason, although they have all the land. And if you still think Azerbaijani side likes peace, well, here's the picture they used in a headline about the recent ceasefire. Yes, a big f***ing blast is used to depict ceasefire. If you think that's weird, well, get this. You cannot visit Azerbaijan, no matter if you're American, French, or even Canadian, if you have an Armenian last name or any Armenian blood in your veins. By the way, don't take our words, just Google it. Seriously, here's one of travel advisors on that. Unfortunately, if you are from Armenia, have Armenian blood, or possess an Armenian surname, you will not be allowed into Azerbaijan. A stamp in your passport from a visit to Armenia can also bar you from entering Azerbaijan. Yep, that's right. Ethnicity-based restriction, the kind of racism that makes Donald Trump look like Mother Theresa. And last but not least thing you should know, their democracy record. Yeah, and don't get us wrong, we know Armenia is not doing great on democracy, but, you know, just compared to this beauty. This week in Azerbaijan, on Wednesday, they were set to vote for a new leader. Well, they announced the election results on Tuesday. You did not hear that wrong. Uh, let me quote the Associated Press here. On Tuesday, the smartphone app of the Central Election Commission released the results of Wednesday's vote showing President Ilham Aliyev, whose family had been, had been at the helm of this oil-rich Caspian Sea nation for four decades, winning 73% of the vote. No, that's not in a different week. Elections on Wednesday, they announced the winner on Tuesday. Oops. They said, well, there was a misunderstanding. I'm sure there was. So when they finally announced the real results on Thursday, the day after the election, well, lo and behold, it turns out it wasn't 73%. That in fact, Aliyev had won with 85% of the vote. 85% for this guy. Let's face it, with mustache like this, 60% is probably most you're gonna get. But 85%? Okay, let's this guy, who by the way is the host of the Young Turks program, explain it to you. When you have an 85 to six election, it was rigged. If Jesus Christ came back down from heaven and God opened up the sky and said, this is my son, he wouldn't get 85%. Well, to be fair, Aliyev is more popular in Azerbaijan than Jesus. So what does Azerbaijan respond when they are criticized for democracy and human rights record? And when you see these sort of headlines in these various papers, the Euro Parliament condemns Azeri human rights violations, references to torture and freedom of expression and so on, is that is that something that uh, is wounding to you, or is it something you say, well, we know there are things like that that we've got to improve on? No, frankly speaking, uh, we, uh, in most of the cases, just ignore these kind of uh, unfriendly steps. It's just too cute. It's like, we don't like this kind of unfriendly criticism. We love friendly criticism. Yeah, the one that makes us look good. Here's how their foreign minister responds to massive fraud allegations. The first family of Azerbaijan. I want to put this to you. The report says in 2005, President Aliyev's wife was named as one of two managers of the Panamanian UF Universe Foundation Incorporated in 2003. And it goes on to say his daughters controlled a Panama Incorporated company and two others in the British Virgin Islands. Your response to these allegations? I have no any information about it, uh, frankly speaking. He just doesn't happen to have the information. When ignorance is gold. When ignorance is oil.
This was Arm Comedy and we really hope the piece holds up. In case you missed our previous English episode, well, here is the link and don't forget to subscribe. Savandas yekira, mesavak nevin kajaran gen.